Hey everyone, this is John with the Active Towns Podcast and the Active Towns Channel. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Uh, today, I have something special. I have two guests uh, from Bicycle Colorado. I have uh, Ashwarya Krishnamurti and Peep Van Hooven. And uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the exciting things that are happening in the state of Colorado and how Bicycle Colorado uh, helps support uh, the initiatives that are happening in the state, in the cities, uh, across the state and uh, some of the exciting things that have happened uh, specifically in the area of policy and some of the legislation that has been uh, passed recently, as well as uh, how the the organization, the state organization, is helping uh, support the cities and the other advocacy organizations from a community engagement perspective. Uh, It's a long one, and it's a great one, and so let's get right to it with Peep and Ashwarya. Well, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome into the Ecamm Studios and the Active Towns podcast, Peep and Ashwarya from Bicycle Colorado. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, for, thank you. thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, hey, to kick things off, uh, Peep, I, I kind of know you. I mean, we, we've we've uh, run in, in some of the same circles. Yeah, we, we've, last time we saw each other was in like 2019 uh, at the uh, People for Bikes uh, Final Mile Leadership uh, Retreat at the amazing adventure uh, place there in the in the hills of, of Boulder. Uh, so I, I'm going to kick this over to Ashwarya first <laughs> to have her uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got involved with uh, Bicycle Colorado. Yeah, so I'm Aishwarya. Um, I started at Bicycle Colorado two and a half years ago. And before that, I was an academic advisor. Um, so and truly not involved in advocacy at all. Um, I started bike commuting long before I was into bike advocacy. So I got into commuting because uh, I lived about two miles from my office. And I, for some reason, was driving to the office and struggling to find parking every day. And my boss bike commuted, uh, which was the inspiration for me to start bike commuting. And I got a lot of support in figuring out where to get my bike and how to find my route. And then I started bike commuting when I moved to Colorado. And as I was looking into switching into communications, I found Bicycle Colorado and it ticked all the boxes, you know, communications job involved with bikes and getting to know my city and my state more and how individuals can be involved in making change. So yeah, that's how I got into bike advocacy and I'm sticking with it because it's, it feels really meaningful to feel like I can be a part of making something be different. Yeah, that's, I love it. I love it. And where were you at? Uh, I, I, you may have mentioned, I mentioned, I, I might have just slipped past me. Where were you at before Colorado? Uh, I was in Rochester, New York. Ah, so that's right. where I went to undergrad. And okay, then I upstate there. New York. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Yeah, that, that mecca for bike commuting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that peep too, because I, several years ago, I had um, somebody, a little town, not far from Rochester, uh, Penfield, Mm -hmm. New York, uh, reached out to me and said, help, please help. Can you come up here and tell us how to become more of an active town? And I'm like, sure. (laughs) And it turned out that I had some money uh, from uh, Kaiser Permanente to travel that year. I think it was like 2013. And so I, I made my way there and then made my way up to Saranac Lake, New York, uh, which also reached out to me almost at the same time and said, we are an active town. Come up and profile us. And I'm like, OK, <laughs> so I'll, I'll do both uh, Penfield, Rochester area and Saranac Lake and then also made my way over to uh, Lake Placid, which is another mm-hmm. quintessential active town. So good stuff. OK, Peep, your turn. Uh, tell us your story and how you uh, came to uh, Bicycle Colorado. Yeah, I I have a fun story, um, and it dates back to 2008. Um, I was a development director for a statewide nonprofit that focused on environmental advocacy by getting uh, citizens involved in trail building um, and taking care of sort of our our outdoor spaces. And um, I was ready for a job switch, and I was going to take the summer off and paint the house. And um, to clean my brain, I went on the bicycle tour of Colorado because I really enjoyed bike tours and I was tent camping in Telluride and a friend of mine called and she worked at um, Bikes Belong, which is now called People for Bikes. Um, They're the um, advocacy arm of the U.S. bicycle industry based out of Boulder. 
And she said, hey, you know, Pete, my boss has got some really cool project coming up with the Democratic National Convention in Denver, and they want to run a large scale bike sharing program. And we need somebody to organize uh, volunteers and work with the city and work with sponsor Humana Healthcare. Um, and are you interested? And I said, no, and hung up, went to bed. And then I woke up in the morning and called her back. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I, I would love to do it. This sounds great. Um, so that got me uh, connected with the city of Denver and the local group, which was Bike Denver, and the state group, which was Bicycle Colorado. Um, and working on that, um, uh, it was called uh, the Freewheel and Bike Share Project, um, which was produced at the Democratic National Convention and then also at the Republican National Convention. And it was a catalytic moment for Denver because it branded Denver as a great town for biking. What we saw was um, that it was really easy to get around town on bikes. And we actually had a little less traffic because people were nervous about the crowds coming. And it was um, it was so pleasant. It was so welcoming. Um, people really enjoyed it. They loved seeing the bikes around town. And it was sort of that moment that convinced then Mayor John Hickenlooper that Denver was a great place to launch large scale bike sharing in the, in the Rocky Mountain West. Um, so I think two years later, Denver launched B-Cycle, which had a great 10-year run. Um, and that really, I think, changed, um, changed the whole ambiance of the city and made it very bike-friendly and, and welcoming. Um, the, the biking is for everybody in the cities, including cities in the West, are a great place for this. Um, so I got sucked in um, because I got to know the Bike Denver folks, and they were looking for a executive director at the time. And they were all volunteers. So I actually came on board and used some of those development skills and created a strategic plan and ended up as their first executive director and sort of built uh, sort of the professional um, staff around that effort. And, um, you know, fast forward five years later, I, I ended up at Bicycle Colorado. And here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Now, did you have any overlap uh, with uh, with Dan uh, as yeah. the. Uh, OK, fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, I touched base with Dan a lot when I was at Bike Denver because yeah. uh, they were right in town and uh, he was obviously the lead on the statewide issues. Um, yeah. And as goes Denver, so goes the state. So it was right. important to be tightly aligned with him. Um, so I worked with Dan, um, I think, two years before our, our executive director, Pete Piccolo, came on board. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So what I think I would, I'd like to do is is give sort of what, what we were just talking about is a little bit of like that 30,000 foot level uh, look at Bicycle Colorado. And this is the your, your website here. And if you'd like me to pull anything uh, up specific, uh, you know, don't hesitate to direct me. But uh, uh, let's let's go ahead and uh, Ashwarya, go ahead and, and give like a, an overview of <laughs> all the amazing things that Bicycle Colorado is involved with. Yeah, so Bicycle Colorado is celebrating 30 years this year of bike advocacy. Um, and, you know, in that time, we it's super exciting. <laughs> in that time, you know, we've developed an education team, a, an awesome policy team. Uh, we're membership based. And we also, you know, I think one of our big goals is changing the conversation and changing the culture around biking in Colorado. Um, so in terms of our education team, we have folks who teach children and adults to ride bikes. We teach confident commuting lessons. So, you know, encouraging workplaces to help their employees try out a different way of getting around. Our policy team advocates at the state and federal level for laws that protect people riding bikes and encourage biking, whether it's for transportation, recreation, or anything. Uh, and yeah, like I said, membership based. So, you know, we can do it because there are people in Colorado who support the work and think it's important. Yeah. I'd love to, I'm going to pull up, uh, since you r really emphasize the membership base, I'm going to pull up a couple of membership photos here and, and, and dive into that. Uh, Cause that's a, that's a challenge, right? You know, being a membership based organization, um, how does that really work from, from a funding standpoint for you guys? Yeah. So we have multiple sources of funding, which I think was very helpful during the pandemic. Uh, we're membership based, but we also get grant funding as well as fee for service. So our educators charge to teach people to ride bikes. Um, but our members support the work that we do at the policy level, getting, mm -hmm. you know, PEEP and our policy folks out there in the legislature. Uh, they support our work teaching people and building our education team and building our team generally. Right. Yeah. 
That's fantastic. And uh, you, you did mention uh, education and uh it, would you like to dive a little deeper into to kind of what it, the education uh, initiatives are all about? Yes. So the photo that you actually have pulled up right now is from when our teammate Molly was teaching a course called Bicycle Friendly Driver in communities around the state. So I think we were teaching this for a few years. And this is, you know, lessons for drivers as well as people riding bikes on how to navigate around other road users. And actually, it's funny you pulled this up. We are developing an online curriculum version of this that will be rolling out later this year that, you know, will help us spread this, this education to the rest of the state in a more efficient and accessible way. So that's something we're really excited about to provide education on navigating the roads, you know, I think in ways that you might not necessarily learn in driver's education or might not remember. Right. after many yeah. years of driving. So uh, we're very excited for our education team to lead on that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. And it has roots uh, right there in Colorado. That particular uh, curriculum uh, was uh, developed up in Fort Collins uh, by Jamie. What's her last name? Help me out. I think it's Gaskell. Gaskell, Jamie right. Gaskell. Yes, absolutely. And uh, and the great thing about that, too, is it got adopted by the League of American Bicyclists, too. And and so uh, and she's one of the the, the coaches for uh, the Colorado region uh, for for teaching uh, uh, from that education side, like with the LCI uh, programs and, and training up folks. And so it's good stuff. So it's that type of of uh, the bicycle friendly. And then there's also some other fun education related things that you do. Yes. Um, so we also table at a lot of different events. So um, fairs and, you know, just like bike events to sort of bring that education to the community and be a part of uh, local activities where we teach people, you know, how to fit a helmet properly or uh, how to, you know, fit a bike properly or how to repair a bike. And this is from something from before my time, but I think I know what it is. Our education team got to it done representation on their uh, adaptive bike fleet, which is very exciting. And I think early 2020, uh, I also got to be a part of an activity like this at Craig Hospital, which is a hospital for people with brain and spinal cord injuries. Mm -hmm. And that was a really awesome education experience. So, you know, we're learning as, as we're teaching as well. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Hey, I'm going to trampoline off that for just a minute. Yeah, we're please so do. Excited yeah. about um, like Tigger trampolining. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the shift driving program, which is going to go online, I'm so jazzed about that. Um, I mean, I think there's a huge need um, for that behind the windshield perspective. Mm -hmm. Thinking about how to how to move a, a car around bikes and pedestrians is basically what we're talking about here. Right. Um, particularly for older drivers and, and younger drivers who haven't either they haven't had the experience or they're you know very confused by the change with all the new types of bike infrastructure and different right. signage and et cetera that they see. So, um, so there's that piece of it, but also the ability to just really launch this educational vehicle um, with some really new robust platforms because there's a lot of potential uh, to partner with large employers and municipalities and education um, organizations to really begin to get at the heart of that culture change on the roadway we're looking for. And it all starts with the right information and education. Right. Yeah. And people will we'll stick with you here for just a moment to, to uh, kind of share from like the, the government side and some of the uh, exciting uh, things that have been happening uh, recently in the state of Colorado. Uh, there's an awful lot of smiley faces here. Why is everyone so happy? <laughs> Um, everybody is so happy because we were able to finally pass um, some landmark statewide safety stop legislation this year. And it's been a five year effort. So we're we're happy and relieved. Um, and uh, if you've gotten me started on policy, just be forewarned, you're going to have to cut me off at a certain point. <laughs> but um, <laughs> All right, enough. <laughs> Yeah. So every year we work in uh, this, our governor, Jared Polis, um, you can't see the light blue sneakers that are his trademark that he's wearing right now um, in a happy moment here after the bill signing. Yeah. Um, every year we participate in the legislative session and we're looking for road safety bills that are great for biking or not great for biking um, and, and getting involved in mixing it up and using that opportunity to talk to legislators and educate and, um, and educate through the law as well. So Every year that we do this is is always so different. Um, 
uh, we go in with a game plan and then things will happen that you don't expect. Um, and I'll di diverge um, briefly into a little tutorial on like, how do you get a bill passed into law? Because it's a pretty complex process. It, I, I call it the, the game of Tetris, sort of you line everything up and then you have to make quick adjustments along the way. Right. <laughs> um, but it often involves 10 steps. I mean, you first have to get um, a legislative sponsor who's committed to um, work with you on drafting the bill, um, to sponsor the bill, to present the bill. Um, you want co-sponsors. Ideally, you want bipartisan support. You want it in both the House. So you need uh, representatives to sponsor and senators to sponsor. Um, so you, you have to draft the bill, get the champion. Then they have to introduce it. And that could sometimes even be a challenge. Once it's introduced, it starts in one chamber. It has to pass that chamber before going to the other chamber. And then the governor has to not veto it, essentially. But right. the, the 10 steps, um, you know, traditionally would be something like, you know, the bill goes to the House Transportation Committee um, and has to pass that committee. Then right. it will go to Finance Committee and Appropriations Committee. So one is if it's going to make the state money and the other is if it's going to cost the state money. And there are often elements of both. So that's potentially three committees before it even gets to the full chamber vote. And then it flips to the next chamber. You got to do it all over again. And if they make any changes or amendments there, it has to go back to the original chamber to repass and then the governor. So, so that's the democratic process and it's messy um, and it's hard, which is I think right. a good thing because you want some serious vetting on, on your bills before they become law. So right. yeah. that's the process. Um, and just historically going back, um, I'll brag a little on, on our legislative track record, but uh, in 2017, which was sort of the year before I, I took on that role, uh, we were able to pass e-bike definitions, which were important. Uh, mm -hmm. First rolling coal bill, which made rolling coal illegal and um, beef up hit and run penalties. And then in 2018. Okay, time out, time out, time out. Yeah, time see, out. see, I told you you were going to have trouble no, with no, me. No, 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 it's, right, it, it's not that. It's not that. We we just, we, 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 we threw some terms out there that I make sure, yeah. want to make sure we, we define. Uh, again, we've got an international audience. So define rolling coal. What is rolling coal? Rolling coal is awful. Rolling coal is when a diesel vehicle is, uh, ha has its emission system retrofitted such that when they stomp the accelerator in a certain way, it emits a big, huge, black, sticky, icky, smelly um, cloud of, of black smoke that will obscure the whole roadway. Literally, it's it's um, it is not normal. And um, they do it. Uh, people who own these vehicles and retrofit these vehicles in this way, they do it actually on purpose, on demand right. at things like bicyclists or Teslas, for some reason, the people who own coal rolling cars don't like electric vehicles and like to blast them, or even people sitting outdoors in a cafe. Um, right. And so, so rolling coal is, um, you know, it's obviously bad for the air quality. It's dangerous for bicyclists because once you're enveloped in the black cloud, you can't see anything and it's really right. scary. Um, yeah. So it's very antisocial behavior. <laughs> oh, yes. It's the worst. Um, <laughs> So, so, so the act of rolling coal became illegal in 2017, which was great. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so the so other thing, I, the other thing I wanted to say, peep, just, just to jump in is that one of the things that you said earlier is that it's this huge long journey gets to the point where we're at right here in this photograph, which is the signing of the bill. Um, mm -hmm. and sometimes the, the governor, will veto it or, or not, you know, move forward. And I think that that happened recently in California where it got all the way to the desk. And for whatever reason, sometimes we don't know all the reasons behind uh, because these are incredibly difficult. They are incredibly complicated. You know, they can get to, you know, that, that pen, that signature doesn't happen and it becomes, you know, it, it, and then the choice is, okay, do we veto it? And then if I understand the, the democratic process, you know, well enough, maybe there's an opportunity to override a veto. There is. Um, but with all that said, the, the really what I wanted to hone in on here is how long did it take to get to the signing of this? And then let's also define what the bill is because Many people, I guarantee you, won't know what a safety stop bill is. Sure, absolutely. Um, so safety stop law is essentially different traffic regulations for bicyclists primarily at stop signed intersections or at uh, lighted red light signalized intersections. Um, 
So it allows bicyclists to operate in a different fashion at stop signs and at red lights, essentially. And um, chiefly, um, it, it existed in a couple of key states, although the idea of safety stop law is really gaining momentum. And this picture here is our Governor Jared Polis signing Colorado's safety stop law. So we're now one of those states as well. Um, but actually it began in Idaho. It's, it's right. been traditionally called the Idaho stop law 40 years ago. So it's been working really well in Idaho for 40 years. Um, and the states that passed it after that, I'm going to try and remember this in order, but I believe it was Arkansas. Um, and oh golly, I've lost, I've lost the third one that was uh, the standard bearer. Um, uh, but now I think we have eight states. If I have that right, I'll go back and check before we're done with the podcast. And the, um, the incident that you're referring to when, when a governor vetoed similar legislation happening in California, it happened last year um, where they brought a bill and it, it went very successfully through their legislative process, but the governor did veto it. Um, my supposition would be that um, he had some department heads that really didn't want to see that pass. That's probably his state patrol or it could be his um uh, it could be his Department of Transportation. So, so actually, that was not a very good setup for us coming into our year of presenting it because right. there was a recent example of a governor vetoing it. And um, with our safety stop effort, um, the quick version is that we had a legislator who first introduced the concept in twenty uh, eight in twenty seventeen, and it, it died in its first committee because it was a new idea, very scary. Um, so we came back with a different uh, approach in 2018, and we passed it as a local option. Um, the idea here being that you write into law how a safety stop should be used, what the, what the legal opportunity would be at the stop sign and the red lights, and then allow any local municipality to adopt it if they choose to. Um, because when you talk about different regulations for bicyclists at intersections, there's two arguments. The first one is, well, should we allow for this? And then the second one is, what should it look like? And that can get very confusing because sometimes people want just the stop signs and or, you know, a different methodology at red lights. So standardizing what it looks like, I think was very important. So we have that standard in the law, 2018. Um, and this year we were able to come back and apply that statewide. Um, so what the Colorado safety stop law provides for is that Bicyclists can yield at a stop sign. If there's no traffic, that means they slow down. They look both ways. If there's no traffic, they can continue through the stop sign. And at red lights, they have to stop. And again, then if there is no oncoming traffic, they can proceed through the red light. And the whole premise is we want to get out of the intersection before the traffic arrives because it's safer. Right, right. And, and just the pragmatic nature of many of these environments where you're literally stop there waiting and you're looking around and like, there's nobody there, <laughs> you know? So, and, and like you said, if you sit there long enough and you wait, next thing you know, now there's, now there's cars, <laughs> you know, it's like, ah, I should have just gone. Okay, cool. Well, there's, there's actually, there is a benefit to the motorists too. Um, I mean, what the yeah. safety data shows is that most of the crashes happen at intersections and it's because right. the light turns green and everybody goes at once and so right. on. So if you clear out before, if you're allowed yeah. to clear out before, if you're not getting a ticket for doing something that's sensible and reasonable, yeah. um, we hopefully have more biking, safer options, and um, just a smoother flowing transportation system. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to come back I mean, this, to you to talk is, about... This is what the Dutch do regularly right. and with no problem. Like They kind of right. just all look out for each other. And if they have the right of way, which is to say they got there first, they get to go first. It's pretty right. simple stuff. Yeah, you just you 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 mentioned the Dutch, and one of the things that they're they're starting to look at right now is even completely naked intersections. They're taking you know where where they previously had you know protected bikeways and complicated intersections and and all this, and they're now looking at exploring that once you bring the motor vehicle speeds down, you can do all sorts of creative things mm -hmm. like completely remove all of the traffic signals and let it be. Uh, quote unquote, controlled chaos. And so there's one famous intersection that I love in, in Amsterdam where they did that. And the safety ratings, you know, actually went up, not down because, you know, you're, you're traffic calming, you're bringing the speeds down and, uh, and then it gives people the opportunity to 
make eye contact and, and be able to, to navigate. So we can spend the whole Sorry. podcast just talking about you know, the subtleties there, but I want to get um, back over to Ashwarya to talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the uh, aspects of, of how you engage with your community. And so from a community engagement perspective, um, how is it that, you know, the, the organization as a whole, you know, strives to try to, uh, to, to really, you know, get people engaged and involved. And, and, and I've got a few photos that you sent my way and that we can scroll through here. Yeah. So we have, I think a bit of a challenge in that we have a lot of different audiences right. that follow our work, that support our work and who we would like to be engaged with. Um, and it's not just about the bike, you know, this, these photos here are from the Denver solidarity rides that took place in May and June of 2020 after the murder of George Floyd, right. uh, which was, you know, a, a major crisis in the United States. And I think for us at that time, we really had to think as well, you know, how is our work equitable? How is it relevant to the needs of people for whom like getting to bike might not be exactly the the point of you know their interest, but yeah. it could be a way to help them feel more free or help them build community with each other. Yeah. And so being part of community events, being part of activities to raise awareness about inequities in our communities is also an important part of our advocacy work because it's not just about riding bikes, it's about how biking is a way to connect with our community. Yeah. And I think that's something that we, that I'm really glad that we started explicitly talking about a couple of years ago and want to continue talking about, you know, forever. Yeah. And I've paused on this particular photo um, because I see somebody I recognize. They're still locantori. Yeah, <laughs> so Jill's been a previous guest on the podcast, and uh, this is the Denver Streets Partnership. And uh, I think this is a good place for us to pause and, and talk a little bit about um, the fact that uh, the <laughs> the nature of the uh, the advocacy. Uh, situation there in Colorado and in Denver in particular has changed quite a bit from the time when you were over at uh, Bicycle Denver. Uh, I, I'll serve this up and I'll let either of you, uh, you know, jump in and, and talk a little bit about that cha changing landscape from an advocacy perspective and, and what the current status is. Yeah, I can kick it off and pass sure. off then to Ashwarya. Um, when I came on board at Bicycle Colorado, it was actually specifically to focus on Denver uh, because our board had sort of taken a, a scan of the state, recognized that the capital city was really behind other cities like Boulder, like Fort Collins, et cetera. And, you know, with the knowledge that uh, if we didn't have a, a state capital city that was really leading on bikes, it was going to be very hard to um, lead the state on bikes. So um, I got to lean into that space, you know, specifically for, for my first two years at Bicycle Colorado before um, focusing more broadly on our, our state policy work. And, you know, I thought that was a really interesting time because what we saw was we actually had really great um, energy and enthusiasm and expertise for mobility advocacy in the transit world and the pedestrian world and, and in the bike world as well. Um, but uh, there were so many people beginning to talk about mobility that we were almost at a point where we were going to be competing with each other working in these silos. Yeah. So I was able to, with Jill, um, who was at Walk Denver at the time, bring together those Denver mobility advocates um, and form them sort of under uh, a loose coalition and umbrella that we called the Denver Streets Partnership um, to begin to really work together on mobility advocacy. Um, because we knew that if we had uniform messaging um, and if we worked together uh, addressing issues at the city, that the city was uh, going to be much more likely to be responsive. and. Right. We were actually hearing from them, essentially, please, can you guys get together and pre-coordinate so we don't have to take all these meetings? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I think the test case here has worked extraordinarily well. I mean, I think our, our first um, effort together was really just to say, dear, dear City of Denver, you have got to increase your funding for mobility, um, for uh, bike and ped investments in particular. That was our, our beginning focus. And the the numbers jumped from, you know, nothing in the case of sidewalks to, um, you know, in the millions today. Um, so it was that first effort to say you, you have to have a significant investment in your active transportation infrastructure. Yeah. Um, so fast forward to today where I'll let Ashwarya take over um, 
you know, we, we've managed to sort of um, conglomerate sort of those, those interests and formalize that effort under this new nonprofit, the Denver Streets Partnership that Jill leads. And it's incubated right now in Bicycle Colorado. And you actually came in right about when this was happening, Ashoria. So maybe you could talk about what that looked like from your end. I did. Yeah. So I, yeah, I started just a couple months before we, we took Denver Streets Partnership into our office. And that was a very interesting time for me and for the office, I think, to think about what are the connections between our bike advocacy work and the sort of broader multimodal advocacy work. And I think it's been a really fruitful connection. You know, our work is very similar. In the end, we are advocating for people to get around and to enjoy outside of a car, whatever whatever mode they are taking. And I, it, people, touched on this earlier, what happens in Denver also spreads to the rest of the state. And so having the, uh, the history and, you know, I guess the power of Bicycle Colorado behind Denver Streets Partnership can lead to really big precedent setting changes in the city that can serve as an example for other communities statewide. So it's very exciting to, to have that connection with them. Yeah. It's an interesting, um, trend that I have seen happening uh, in the advocacy world over the last 10, 15 years, and, and it's accelerating within the last uh, three to five years. And we, we just saw it happen here in, in Austin as well, where, uh, you know, as you mentioned, Peep, you know, the, the advocacy organizations in their silos, the, the pedestrian advocates, the bike advocates and the safety advocates, uh, you know, are starting to come together and realize that there may be more power and more relevance if we can all be under a similar type of tent. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's and, and part of the reason why I'm seeing this is is it's hard, you know, having spent many, many years uh, on boards of directors and in helping with advocacy organizations and trying to keep volunteers interests up and engagement up. It's hard uh, to do that. And so there's there's always these peaks and valleys and, you know, and uh, it, it's hard to keep, you know, the the momentum in the initiative going. And they started seeing that here in, in Austin. And I've seen this happen in, in other cities uh, in the past 15 years as well. So it, it's a wonderful test case. I pointed to uh, this particular example, the Denver Street, Streets Partnership recently, uh, you know, for the local folks when they were you know considering this and doing this. And I'm encouraging them to do that because it really does help, I think, cut down some of the barriers that exist that when we're in our little silos, it's easy to be dismissed as, oh, you're just the crazy bike people or, you know, it, it's like, oh, no. I mean, <laughs> you mentioned it, Ashwarya, right there. It's like, you know, these it's it's about, you know, quality of life for everyone. You know, our streets are for people. And and so, I, Peep, you've been around a long time with this and, and engaged in this at various levels. What, what's your commentary on that? I mean, obviously, there's there's pros and cons to both approaches. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it, they're, they're pretty much only pros. Um, the the okay. more partners we have, um, the more broadly we can talk about the messaging about streets are for people and all of the societal yeah. benefits that come from that, the more successful everyone is going to be. So it doesn't matter how you enter the effort. Yeah. Um, and whether, you know, it's because you want a bike commute or you want affordable transit or, you um, yeah, you recognize that the nice sidewalks are only on one part of town. Um, together, we, we have a much stronger, much broader message. And it is about those community benefits, the Shwari I was talking about earlier. And it it means that we can frame these issues under the big social issues of our time, which are climate change and air quality and health and supporting local business and, um, you know, uh, giving people accessibility to the things in their lives that matter. Um right. And so broader is better unequivocally. It's sometimes more confusing and hard to organize. And there are an awful lot of coalitions out there, but it's absolutely yeah. better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's one of those things. I mean, I'm going to pull up a few more images here of, of just like some of the experiential things and, and, you know, really kind of emphasizing that, you know, streets are our largest 
you know, in general, in each from city to city to city, it's one of our largest uh, public realm areas that that we have. And so the more that we can do to to make, you know, our streets safer for people. And this, I'm assuming, was probably a, an initiative associated with the pandemic. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is a photo of uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, our partners the Community Active Living Coalition here in Denver. Okay. Um, they partner with the Denver Streets Partnership and we provide micro grants to community members to create projects that nice. uh, you know, can help their communities get more involved in active transportation and mobility and spending time outside. And so one of the grant winners uh, had a project where at one of the closed streets during the pandemic that allowed people to recreate on the street, they did some street art, which you saw with the spray painting. And this uh, Parks to the People ride here is a ride uh, encouraging the city to continue to keep parks close to cars and open to everyone else. Yeah. Were were we successful with that? (laughs) There are a couple of parks and a couple of streets in Denver that have continued to stay open to, you know, bikes and pedestrians and hoping it continues and hoping some of them that were closed earlier or rather reopened earlier, I guess, do come back. Yeah, yeah. I think the the big change there is that now when the city takes a look at whether to keep a street, uh, you know, a little car light or or remove parking and keep it removed from parks, the the default isn't, well, of course, there should be cars and how should we accommodate them, which was our previous default before COVID. And the rethinking of, you know, how do we use our street space? Now it is, what's the balance, um, which is the appropriate place for the conversation to be. Right. Yeah. I'd love for us to pop on over to um, the topic of e-bikes and e-bike legislation. And um, I, I think, Peep, you, you wanted to, to you know, say a few words about this. And while you're talking, I'll just kind of flow through a few of the photos. Um, what's going on? Because this is something that's significant. You had mentioned that that was one of the early things that took place was the definition of what an e-bike was in the context of Colorado. What? But I don't think that's what this is about. What's, what's this all about? Sure. Prepare to cut me off again. Um, (laughs) I'm I'm really enthusiastic about e-bikes. And I'll just say why. I mean, I think when we talk about growing the bike movement, we've seen a couple of real jumps. Um, The first one was when biking for transportation was sort of legitimized. And for me, I think I saw that happen in Denver when we launched um, bike sharing um, and B-Cycle, because then it became something that was normal for everyone. So we saw a real jump in ridership there. I think the next wave was really the wave of women getting out there on bikes, which um, that has changed dramatically, um, in my opinion, in the the past five to seven years, we saw another bump. And now we, well, we have the bike boom from the pandemic. So let's call that 3.0. And now we have e-bikes and they are absolutely a game changer um, because this is the machine that is going to reduce the single occupancy vehicle trip in cities. Um, where I think you know the statistic, but the majority of trips in cities are a distance of two miles or less, which is a very silly um, distance to get in a car and turn the key on for. Um, And it's a perfect distance for a bike ride. And e-bikes just make it easy. Um, They can make a trip from two to to 10 miles easy. And they're great for light cargo delivery, but um, I can talk about that some other time. So uh, we've had a couple of really great opportunities to help boost e-biking in Colorado and Um, Our communications and policy director, Jack Todd, got this rolling for us by um, working with the Colorado Energy Office to start a mini pilot. And these are the pictures that you're seeing are some of the first recipients of e-bikes as part of that mini pilot, um, where we took 13 individuals um, who met uh, low income criteria that needed to solve a transportation issue. Um, So they were provided. This is Jack taking me out on the cargo bike ride. Yeah, I, I think. I think I'm the cargo there. You are. <laughs> um, do I look nervous? <laughs> um, um, so with that mini pilot, um, I, you know, we just uh, worked with the Colorado Energy Office to show them how to partner with the bike shop and organize the bikes and select qualified applicants and then measure using the, um, it was NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab here in, in Colorado, did a um, did the measurement piece with a special app. Um, and so we were able to produce the data and statistics coming from that to show that they changed their transportation habits and it solved the transportation need. Um, and that original mini pilot led to the energy office, um, you know, releasing uh, more dollars and offering up seven different pilots across the state 
um, in Denver, Durango, Pueblo, Boulder, Fort Collins, um, and an area of North Denver, um, where that's all been replicated on a much broader uh, scale, and that's happening right now. And um, fast forward to this year's legislative session, um, which was all about air quality uh, issues, where um, we were fortunately able to support a bill that, that uh, is going to bring millions to help electrify Colorado school buses, and then a $12 million investment in e-bikes, which is nation leading at this point. I think California has a $10 million investment and Connecticut recently joined with a $10 million investment. But this will be a program we'll see roll out in 2023, I think. Um, it is a specifically uh, a rebate program for, for low income Coloradans um, so that they can, um, they can purchase an e-bike at a, a very discounted rate. Um, again, it's meant to make it easy and affordable to get an e-bike instead of buying a clunker right. and um, to change the trips in cities. So really excited to see that roll out um, and get to support that work. Um, uh, and I paused on this particular photo uh, just to channel that, that whole concept of trying to make it a little bit more feasible to offset your typical motor vehicle trips, your car trips. And so this is, uh, you know, a cargo bike, obviously quite happy to have uh, picked up some, uh, some stuff from the garden shop here. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have, um, I can't remember who organizes this. There's a group in Denver called the Denver bike lobby and periodically yeah. they will post pictures of all the stuff they can get on their bikes yeah. Um, it's sort of a running competition. Um, <laughs> and we've seen everything from, you know, holiday trees to, um, you know, the weekly grocery shop to this lumber. Yeah, lumber. <laughs> yeah, lumber. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a sofa. I saw a sofa once. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So and this is a couple more images from uh, I think that speak to the power of that uh, ability of those initiatives, of those trials, to be able to get electric uh, mobility into the hands of, of people who really need them. And I think the point is too, is that when we look at those distances that are inherently rideable, um, we see an exponential increase in the ability to, uh, to legitimately make uh, a a trip by bike, um, you know, simply because, you know, we, we normally, when we think of like a, a, a bike shed, when we think of the you know, amount of distance that, that we could go, you know, maybe the upper limit is, is like around, you know, four miles per, or, you know, per, per trip, uh, on the upper limit on a normal bike, but suddenly with an electric assist bike, the ability to get to your destination, that meaningful trip that you're, you're trying to take, you know, maybe that is I increased. Maybe you're talking, you know, somewhere in the five to six to seven mile range is still quite doable and feasible. Um, or maybe you're trip chaining and you're doing uh, multiple different uh, stops along the way. And uh, yeah, the excitement, you know, the, did we even talk about how much fun it is? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, um, so it's, there's a, there's a wee factor to being on e-bike. <laughs> People really just fall back in love with biking again on these things. They are very fun. Yeah. Um, I think they're a game changer for seniors and getting yeah. them back out there and healthy. Um, I really like that. I think they're a game changer for moms, um, who just need a little extra boost to carry all the stuff they're carrying or go the distances they're going. Yeah. And I'm loving the fact that um, our low income populations are really beginning to, I think, once you do a little work demystifying things, demystify the bike, how does it work? Yeah. Some of the barriers, like how do you find parking? What about route finding? You know, you have to do it in, in Spanish and in English and provide some supports. Um, but this is a fantastic um, transportation problem solver. Yeah. And it's fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. A couple of the things that that come to mind when we, we talk about trying to encourage um, more ridership, uh, ultimately, what people will tell you is, you know, OK, let's let's say we we've we've got the the machine fixed, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the bike is now a fun, uh, easier ride. Uh, they'll tell you is safety. They, they, they feel concerned that the built environment around them is not conducive to them, uh, riding. How is bicycle Colorado helping in the state of Colorado, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, that side of things in terms of making it feel like there is a safe and inviting, you know, 
comprehensive, cohesive, and connected na- network out there. Yeah, and this is really the crux of the problem. It's the infrastructure that we have today, um, and many of our roads are not safe. Um, there's no question about that. So we we do work on the road safety law. We work on culture. We work on education, all those things that surround it. But at the end of the day, it's going to be road design, street design that um, makes the difference. It gets more people out there riding, more people feeling comfort that comfortable and that the drops our numbers of crashes and fatalities. Um, okay, Pete, so, you, you, you slip something in there, the road safety law. What's that? Well, a road safety laws, plural. So plural. a variety, okay. Got it. variety of them. So things okay. like, you know, the bike lane bill uh, that we worked on last year, vulnerable user bill from Got the it. year before the safety stop bill and so on. This is a cool photo here of, um, I'll tell the story of this bike lane real quickly, but um, this is a protected bike lane that is on 14th Street. It runs right in front of the convention center, which you can see there on the right. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, I think I can see the uh, blue bear looking in the windows in the distance. You can. Yes, that is our blue bear. Um, This used to be just a big line of taxis all piled up on the right-hand side. And um, really hard to get around. Um, if you were biking, you'd be in the uh, in the car lane, and the taxi door would be opening, and it, it was sort of chaos with people like leaving the convention center. So, so this is an example of a very successful protected bike lane in downtown Denver because it removed um, that um, stopping and um, sort of quick uh, onloading, offloading of passengers chaos. Um, and it is fully protected with those cement barriers. You can see this is not a comfortable thing to drive over and people don't do it very often. If they do, there's usually some other issue going on. Um, it protects some of the pedestrian space in the plaza in front of the convention center. So it's improved the ambiance generally for that particular facility. Um, and it's working great. It's my direct line to get up to the Capitol to advocate from our office downtown. So I ride it really frequently. Hmm. Um, What's Bicycle Colorado doing? Um, I mean, we're working on the state level to be sure that more dollars flow to multimodal projects. So bike infrastructure, pedestrian infrastructure, and to a certain extent, um, things that support transit, because we know the more people that can get around safely in buses, uh, the less car trips we're going to see. Um, and then, you know, the, the safer we're all going to be on the roadway and the, the better options we'll have as well. And, um, and at least in Denver, you guys have at least the beginnings of a, of a you know, rail transit option, too. Yes. So we have a, a Denver Moves Transit Plan. Um, we have some BRT corridors that have been identified. Um, and we have some advocates who are working really, really hard on that right now. Yeah. Um, so the, the big work, um, I guess I would point to, and not to take too long on this, the, um, the state passed a transportation bill last year in the legislative session, which mm-hmm. is what I spent most of my time working on. And it did direct a lot of money towards multimodal funds, and it made a lot of the, um, the transportation dollars available to our Department of Transportation flexible enough that those dollars could be used for mobility projects and mobility improvements. So um, we were really able to turn on the taps for mobility funding via that state bill last year. And we're currently now working to be sure that the federal money that is coming, that is then filtered through Colorado Department of Transportation um, and is beginning to pull up projects from CDOT's 10-year plan and from our MPOs, which is a municipal planning organization, a, a big group of um, counties or cities that um, work together uh, on regionally connected mobility projects to be sure that uh, one, there are a lot of good feeder projects coming into that. Two, the great projects are getting pulled up and assigned funding and then sort of bird dogging those as they go through the process. Um, this is going to be uh, a great year for, for mobility project funding because much of the state money was front loaded. So almost all the mobility projects that are great are getting pulled up right now. Mm-hmm. So now the pressure becomes to be sure that we are working with local advocates to spin up their next best options into those plans so that when the next rounds of funding come, we're ready to bring them forward again. Yeah. I paused on this <laughs> just because I love oh. the Terry Creek uh, bikeway. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if you know this, uh, Pete, but uh, back in the 90s when I lived in, in Boulder, uh, there were a few years when I I made the commute every morning from Boulder to Denver. And, and I had a I, I was the national wellness program manager uh, for MCI uh, communications back in the day when we had a, such a thing as long distance telephone. And uh, and so I got to I came to know uh, Denver quite 
quite well as, you know, in the nineties and I was doing the bus trip and I would get off at market street station, which of course is basically been, you know, replaced by a union station there in, in lower downtown Denver. But uh, some of the facilities, you know, like like this particular facility existed even way back in the in the 90s. And of course, the the facilities that we have in uh, Boulder, which are quite extraordinary, are almost all along these riparian corridors. And so what we end up seeing in some of these cities like Boulder, like, uh, you know, Golden to some extent, uh, Fort Collins, to some extent, Denver, is some really extraordinary off-street facilities, like along these riparian corridors. Um, But sometimes we were challenged in these Colorado cities, you know, when it came to transforming the street space, because it uh, it starts to feel like a takeaway from the motor vehicle standpoint when, you know, when the proposal comes out uh, that, oh, by the way, we're going to be taking a lane away or, you know, for car traffic, moving of, of vehicle traffic or parking. Um, how's I mean, you can speak a little bit, a bit to this, you know, from your experience, Pete, but also uh, Ashwarya, also kind of like from your perspective as somebody who, you know, joined this movement relatively recently, what's the bead on on that relationship with the, you know, trying to get the on-street conversions and transformations happening? I'll flip you forward, Ashwarya. Who wants to start? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that... It can be hard when you are used to driving places to imagine that taking away a lane will somehow make it easier for you to get where you need to go. Right. And I think that it's a reflection of a failure of our systems to provide options for people. If you think that the car is the only way you can get somewhere, you're going to be mad that you're, you know, there's less space for your car. And I think the challenge is, is twofold. One is to get moving on getting those, you know, replacing car lanes with bus lanes on getting, giving people more options to get around without a car and education on what induced demand is on how, if you have more options to get to where you need to go, you don't need to drive. You don't need to get stuck in traffic. And, and so I think that there seems to be some change. At least I see that there is conversation at levels of our government, at our Department of Transportation, seeming to start on, start to understand that we can't solve congestion and we can't solve more and more people being on the roads by giving them more lanes. And actually what we need to do is give them more of them. Yeah. yeah. And I Pete. think Pete can probably speak a little bit more to the detail of that. Yeah. Well, that was a great answer. The thing I would add to that would be just there's a... Um, this concept that it has to be one way or the other, and really what we're talking about is we have to get to the right tipping point here. Um, for the, the notion that Ashwari is bringing forward, you know, if you are only thinking about using the transportation system and whether it works for you in a car and that's your sort of benchmark, um, I think it's important to reframe that conversation. It's really, we need to be able to provide enough options so that the people who want to use different options are able to do so. And um, so that every person has the opportunity to make some incremental change. So it's not about everybody must become a bicyclist or everybody must ride transit. Um, It's about the people who would like to, you know, shift a couple trips a week to the bus or maybe bike commute on Fridays can do it and can do it easily. Um, And if if we have enough of that going on, we're going to start to see that um, change in in behavior um, on the streets. it's not that we want absolutely everybody to be a bicyclist. I think, um, you know, from an advocacy perspective, when we lean in with with decision makers and municipalities, what we have to be saying right now, um, and I think that we have to be very forward about it, is you cannot continue to try to balance things because you are working with a system that is currently out of balance. And therefore, you're going to have to prioritize um, the biking and the pedestrian options and the transit options in order to get to, uh, you know, that place where people really do have enough options that they can start to make those choices. And this is where the tension lies. And we're totally not there yet. Um, because, um, you know, most departments of transportation still think in terms of 
we're going to provide these options as a mitigation because we, we must provide the car options and then we're going to sprinkle in a little fairy dust and, you know, give you a couple of things here. Um, that's not balance. That's right. perpetuating an imbalance of the system. Um, well, so- let me, let me jump in and say, say this about, you know, kind of what we're seeing in the landscape and, and, and I have paused on this photo, but I've only paused on this photo, um, just because it's beautiful and, and, it, it, it may, reminds me of that we want to talk a little bit about Switzerland. So <laughs> that's just there. But, you know, what's happening in Colorado, which is really quite fascinating, is there's been some really, really interesting stories coming out of do we keep investing in these automobile lanes? And specifically what I'm thinking of is the recent um, you know, revelation, uh, the recent report that came out uh, that really looked at the climate impacts of expanding freeway miles in in, in the, the the Denver corridor. Um, and you know, I, I know that uh, I believe Bicycle Colorado was involved, uh, as well as RMI, uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute, um, really trying to like get a grip on. Uh, what are the numbers? What are the true impacts? And we can't keep doing what you were just saying there. We can't just keep investing in the old way, the status quo of drive everywhere for everything. Yeah, again, most of the federal dollars are very flexible. And so um, government is used to using those dollars for automobile infrastructure, but it could be used in a completely different way. Yeah. And the flexibility is there coming from our current Department of, of Transportation on the federal level. Um you know, there, there are two things that happen when you invest a lot of dollars in a highway project. The first one is that it's going to invite more congestion. It may give you some short-term benefit for six months or so, but ultimately this is like trying to cure obesity by losing, loosening your belt, right? right? So you get what you build. If you build more car lanes, you're going to get more cars. Um, and that's unequivocal. And you're not just going to get more cars on the, on the highway itself, the throughway. As you build that space out, it's going to put pressure on every arterial and begin to extend into sort of those local communities and those local neighborhoods. And then you're going to you're going to start to see further impacts from that. So you're perpetuating the system if you're if you're solving by trying to add another car lane there. But also you're you're hogging all the money. <laughs> right. um, these projects are unbelievably expensive. And the, the cost of one highway interchange would fund a city's entire bike network. So right. it makes sense to reprioritize and to really prioritize um, the mobility options. And to do that first before you, you look at the areas that you think are congested for automobiles, because otherwise you're just going to perpetuate the existence of the system that we have today. Yeah. yeah. Um, this photo, by the way, is in Aspen and it's yeah. up in the Maroon Bells. Yep. And this is a recreational bike traffic jam um, on a road that is that only allows buses and bikes. And the, interestingly, the tension there is that the bus drivers say it's hard to now get people up there on the bus because there's so many bikes on the road. So I'm going to categorize that as a, as a good problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, <laughs> there is so much demand to get up to see some of these beautiful areas by bus and by bike that they're going to have to have sort of, um, I think they're talking about a bike reservation system. Only a certain number of bikes can be rented out to tourists to go and do this on a day. Yeah. Um, so that the roads aren't too crowded with bikes and buses. How cool is that? Oh, those poor motor vehicles. <laughs> well, you were just in Switzerland and and uh, um, I, I've had the opportunity to visit uh, uh, Switzerland, a couple towns in Switzerland before, uh, you know, they would do something along the lines of say, OK, great. You know, we've got this challenge. We've got this problem. Let's, you know, you know do a funicular or do, do a rail, you know, to be able to, to facilitate that and, and create some separation. Um, since you did just get back, Pete, do you have any uh, immediate observations, you know, based on our conversation um, of, you know, from what you experienced uh, internationally and maybe, maybe some dreams for, you know, to, to this will be sort of your last thing to leave us off with is maybe some Ooh. dreams from Switzerland to uh, what you'd love to see here in Colorado. Um, I got to spend five weeks in Switzerland last year because I was able to take a little work sabbatical and um, we just made a, a trip. I actually have some family there on my mother's side um, back about a week ago. Um, 
And the Swiss transportation system is dreamy. It, uh, they, you know, Europeans spend a lot more dollars on infrastructure. They do it really, really well. Um, their roadways are just generally in better condition and they do, they do design their roads for certain speeds. So you will not see um, sort of a large uh, freeway style road in an urban area. You're always going to see like a mini median and the pedestrian crosswalk, a rotary, something that slows traffic down. Um, and I, let's not forget the fact that they have a phenomenal train, tram and transit system. So there's always an option to get somewhere without a car, even all the way up into the mountains. So um, when I think about how I would like our system to look, I definitely think about cities um, like the ones I've seen in Switzerland, some of the ones I've seen in Holland. Um, on a neighborhood level, um, I think they're just very inventive. And uh, one of the things that that they did that really struck me when I was on my trip there five weeks ago, just I planted myself in one neighborhood for, for a five-week period. Um, they limit the number of parking spaces, and then they intersperse them in like some on the right, one or two on the right, and then one on the left um, throughout the block. Uh, and then they have raised speed uh, humps in the middle of sort of intersections that would be uncomfortable to drive fast through. So the, the result is that they're using the parking space almost like creating a street chicane because you have to shift left and then shift right, right. and shift yeah. left. And then they're charging an enormous amount of money for you to use that parking space. Right. So right. if you are going to have a car and it's not in your garage and you have to park it on the street, you pay for the privilege. You um, There are only a certain number of them on the street. So that neighborhood street which has a lot of kids on it, just like, you know, a lot of the ones we see here in this neighborhood isn't chock full of cars going all the way down the street. It's very light interspersed back and forth. I even saw a configuration once where they had two parking spaces side by side on a one-way street, mm -hmm. um, which created an extremely narrow gap to get through, et cetera. Right. And they, they did that on purpose and right. because they're using parking like right. street design. Yeah. Kind of mm -hmm. funny. Yeah, they're they're creating, like you said, those those chicanes. It's it, it's yeah. creating a, an obstacle course, a, a friction, a level of friction that um, really encourages slower speeds. And um, I like to to remind folks that protected and separated infrastructure always gets the headlines. It always is the thing that we think of when we when we talk about oh cycling networks and everything, and and we think about those protected bike lanes and those separated off street network of of pathways again. The Dutch system, 60 to 70 percent in most cities are actually some form of shared street. It's like extreme traffic calming, bringing the motor vehicle speeds down and, you know, reinforcing the fact that, oh, by the way, you're going to you're going to come across somebody walking. You're going to come across yeah. somebody biking. You're going to come across somebody pushing, you know, a little one in a pram. Get over yeah, it. Slow down. <laughs> they create. Exactly. unapologetically tight spaces to navigate through. Correct. And, yeah. um, you know, one of the other things you definitely notice when you go there is there's no big cars and no big right. trucks. Yeah. They're all medium mm -hmm. size, normal size. And that's because with, with those tight spaces, you'd lose your beer or worse. You know, the F-150 will not fit in a Swiss neighborhood parking spot. <laughs> so one thing that you mentioned there that I want to make sure that we uh, we do is draw the parallel between, um, you know, the those Swiss uh, villages and the ability to be able to get uh, up to the ski resorts and be able to, to take the train. Uh, this is something that, you know, as Colorado, one of the, you know, the main industries that Colorado has is obviously people coming, you uh, you know, to be able to get up to ski resorts. So not only people in the front range wanting to go up and go skiing, um, but just it, it just boggles my mind that we don't have the ability to get to the ski resorts easily, comfortably. Winter Park, I guess, is an exception via train. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're lucky to have the Winter Park set up. It is yeah. sort of a per perfect example to point to. Um, and I am encouraged to see that um, the Colorado Department of Transportation is really beginning to invest in, in transit. Right. Their bus tank service is great um, yeah. city to city. And I see that there's real, real possibility and real potential there with the ability to think about that in terms of our, um, our travel to mountain towns. Pegasus just got started. So we'll see how that goes. Um, yeah, um, it's a conundrum, one I cannot solve today. No, no.
Fantastic. And, but it is encouraging. I mean, the, the news that came out what last week was that they made the decision that they're not going to move forward with massive uh, upsizing of the lanes on uh, I-25 through the city. Is that correct? Yeah. And I think the Denver Street's partnership and Bicycle Colorado's um, footprints are definitely um, on that decision. We worked with a lot of different partners in the environmental community um, to, um, you know, gather a lot of signatures from organizations to send that me- message very unequivocally to see that, that this is, this is what we need to see. And this is the beginning of what I hope will be that concept of the need to reprioritize, um, you know, not spending those dollars on a big highway project like that opens up a lot of possibilities, um, yeah. and, um, sort of, you know, stops the bad pattern that we're in enough for us to hopefully get a reset and really get some some traction on moving our mobility projects forward. Yeah, yeah. So Ashwarya, uh, for your last word, I'd love to get your your sort of your, your perspective. You've been in Colorado now for a few years and you've had this opportunity to, to like really dig into, uh, you know, this sort of area of work, um, you know, for also a few years now. Um, but when you think back to, you know, what your life was like there in Rochester and where what the, the type of work that you're doing now, what are some of the things that, you know, have you like super excited about for the future and the, the potential that uh, Colorado has and Bicycle Colorado and your role in, in, in that? What, what has you super excited and, and gets you charged and ready to go in the morning? Yeah, um, I think when you asked that question, the first thing I thought about is how much more I felt connected to my community when I started walking and biking and taking transit here and how I want that for so many more people around the state and, or, you know, around the, the country. And um, that's what makes me excited about the work that we do is that we advocate to help give people that opportunity to get to know each other and get to know the space around them. And in terms of, you know, what I'm excited about moving forward, I think that on the communications team, I'll, I'll keep it specific to that. We are really excited to continue to help translate the work that we do as, as our policy team, as our education team, to help our followers and to help people who are not already on board to understand what it is that we do and why it is that we do it and why it's important for anyone, whether you primarily drive a car or whether you walk, whether it's for fun or whether because it's you have to. And yeah, I'm just excited to, you know, with the new infrastructure funding coming in, I'm really excited that it seems like there's a bit of a shift, maybe a a major shift in how leaders are thinking about what transportation means to a community. Um, And yeah, I, I guess I'm just excited that advocacy is a long game. And, yeah. you know, we have to be excited about the small wins. And sometimes we get big wins, which we did this year. And it's just really thrilling to be in the middle of it all. Yeah. And I'm reminded, too, that, uh, you know, based on where you're from in upstate New York, that, you know, a lot of times people are just like, oh, you know, the the, the, the numbers of people walking and biking in, in a place, you name the place, the, the Netherlands or whatever, they don't have bad weather. It's like. Hey, look, you know, sometimes the weather can be bad in, in, in Denver, uh, you know, and in, in Colorado in general. But, you know, Ithaca, New York and upstate New York, I mean, they have amazing numbers of people, you know, walking yes. and biking, uh, you know, all year round through terrible, terrible weather. I'll, I'll, I'll be, uh, you know, producing an episode um, from Olu Fendlin. And we talk a lot mm-hmm. about, you know, the fact, yeah, we ride all year round. It, it's just a matter of having appropriate clothing. So totally. It's good yes, stuff. I started uh, bike commuting in March in Rochester, New York. So right uh, spike tires <laughs> all over ice. It was great. It was a, it was a great way to get started. <laughs> no such thing as bad weather, just inappropriate no. clothing. To wrap us up here, uh, just real quick, an opportunity to for last words. Did we miss anything? Is there any major events uh, that we need to plug? Uh, who's who's ready to go? Ashwari, do you have a, a major event that's happening uh, with Bicycle Colorado that we should give a shout out to? Um, nothing huge coming up. We actually just had our big fundraiser, but uh, the, an for event the 30th anniversary. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. right. So we yeah. did celebrate that. 
I think something that we are already preparing for, which won't be until January, February next year, is our Moving People Forward conference. And I just wanted to, yeah, and I I wanted to shout that out because it's an opportunity for us to get in front of leaders at the state level, at the city level, at the national level, to say, here's what we're doing in the multimodal space and to get conversations rolling on what's next. So that's kind of a general plug, I guess. <laughs> Look and out I love for that. It's, um, a, it's a great club or a, a great plug. It's an amazing conference that you all put together. I have had the opportunity to, to uh, participate and, and attend that. So glad that you did mention that. Uh, Peep, any any last things, anything that we missed uh, from, from your side of the world uh, there at Bicycle Colorado that we should uh, leave the audience with? Um, this Thursday, actually, I get to go to a press conference with Shoshana Liu, who's our director of uh, Colorado Transportation, um, and uh, they are going to be unveiling their new three feet to pass signs, okay. uh, which we're excited about. We advocated for um, for so many years. We've had sort of the sign that says share the road. And what we have discovered is that it is confusing. The drivers think the bicyclists should share and the bicyclists think the drivers should share. And it just wasn't working very well. Um, so we're excited about this shift. Um, the signs are going to be definitive. I mean, it says state law motorists must give bicycles three feet clearance. Um, that is a law that bicycle Colorado did help pass. Um, so it's important safety signage and we're excited to see the department, um, rolling that out, um, starting with that press conference on Thursday. And then I, I guess I would just leave you with sort of a preview of coming attractions. Um, if you follow our work, what you're likely to see from us, you know, in the next, year is that um, focus on launching shift driving, which is again, that online right. education resource. Um, I'm going to call this e-bike advocacy 3.0. I'm not entirely sure what it's going to look like, but if it involves e-bikes, we're going to be there. <laughs> right. um, we're very, very bullish on e-bikes. And um, definitely uh, we have a strong focus right now on that advocacy to shift transportation funding to mobility. Um, right. And we're, we're getting deeply into that. Uh, you can find some information on that on on our website, although uh, Sharia will have to tell me where to find the local forum information. Yes, um, I can uh, send you that link and we can put it up there. It's not on our menu, Mr. Oh, okay. okay, cool. <laughs> well. And then lastly, I think um, in the legislature next year, I think we're gearing up for an effort to expand automated enforcement opportunities. Um, okay. So there's some restrictions right now on the ability of Colorado cities to use red light cameras and speed cameras. And we want to change that. Um, we think that uh, technological solutions are going to be a big part of the problem of, of dealing with our reckless driving, dangerous driving, distracted driving issues. Right. Um, so we'll be leaning into that. That could be network level issues like getting cell phone providers to set the phone such that it um, opts you out when you are detected driving a vehicle, um, just as a reminder. And, um, and, and it's removing the handcuffs on the municipalities that want to use automated enforcement yeah. on some pardon, of their. Pardon the pun states. there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that was bad. <laughs> I love it, though. It's so wonderful to reconnect with you, Pete, and such a pleasure to meet you, Ashwarya. Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you. Really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all so much for tuning into this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. Uh, and if you haven't done so already, please, it'd be an honor to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell right next to it. That uh, gives you the ability to customize your notification preferences and uh, alerts you to when I have new content coming out. And uh, gosh, uh, so many great things that have been happening here uh, with the channel. And uh, one of them is the fact that we keep picking up new uh, patrons and more supporters of the uh, channel. Thank you so very much uh, to everyone who has uh, joined the Patreon account and uh, become, you know, some of my Active Towns ambassadors. I really appreciate it. And it helps, you know, keep me being able to do this. And uh, the other thing that you can do to help support the channel is, uh, you know, pop on over. Uh, this is my favorite water bottle, as you probably have noticed if you've watched a few of my channel, <laughs> a few of my videos so far. Uh, there's some fun Streets are for People swag out there on the channel. And if you'd like something else that I don't have out there, just let me know. I, they've got a ton of stuff out there and and, uh, it's all made to go. So if you put your order in, then you know that gets manufactured and sent out to you. Uh, so again, let me know if there's anything you'd like to see. 
And just a quick reminder, yes, I will be going to the Netherlands at the end of October into the first week of November, uh, checking things out out there. Uh, be happy to have you tag along if you're interested in that. Uh, just send me an email at john at activetowns.org and I'll give you all the details. See if it's something that you might want to pop in on and you can you know, join me for a day, two days, the entire week, whatever you want to do. And likewise, at the end of August into the first week of September, uh, I will be in Colorado. I'll be attending and filming the Open Streets event on Sunday, August 28th, and then uh, sticking around for the entire week and then also popping over to film the Tour de Fat event in Fort Collins on Saturday, September 3rd. In that week in between, I'll be uh, out filming, meeting with folks, uh, looking at infrastructure, doing infrastructure profiles, all that kind of good stuff uh, in Boulder, Denver, and Fort Collins. So if you're interested in tagging along, uh, also send me an email, john at activetowns.org. Well, that's it. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. <laughs>